The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Advice Intelligence is the market leader in goals-based advice technology. Offering clients an end-to-end financial planning software solution, AI unleashes the true power of advice by providing a new world of advice software to enable planners to work smarter, not harder. Delivering financial advice in a way that's inspiring, cost-effective, and scalable. AI makes it easy for advisors to have enriched and engaged conversations with clients so they can solve their problems and explore future possibilities together. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team, and today I'm here with Nathan Fradley, a good friend of the show, uh, keen to pick his brain on what he's working on, uh, get a bit of an update on what is happening in the land of ESG, and uh, I know he's got some exciting things in the pipeline that he's keen to share with us. Nathan, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks for having me again, Ben. Mate, so uh, I thought maybe just start, because I know that we only chatted a, a couple of months back, but what are you working on at the moment? I think you know transitioning out of being the business owner into being an employee the the purpose of it was to free myself up for what I really love doing and it turns out I really love coaching mentoring stuff so working with you know my diamond team in Tribeca and you know learning a lot about um I suppose different you know cultural aspects and like within the business different personality types and really connecting with people there and then also um mentoring i've actually started mentoring someone outside of the business um which i've done a little bit solve but never on a formal basis but we actually catch up every two weeks regularly going through and, and helping her develop her uh i suppose skill set in financial planning that's diverse from what she's exposed to at her employer mate i'm keen to dive into that in a little bit of detail but um before we do that the shift that you mentioned around like uh, part of the team, you know, business owner, but then working w- with the team and, and sort of coaching the team. Um, I think that's something that's certainly I found it to be a huge challenge. I, I think that naturally as advisors, you know, you sort of go into advice and do more advice because, you you know, you enjoy and get a kick out of working with clients. So it sort of makes sense that coaching um, team members is, is something that, you know, it sort of lends itself to, but also, it is a, a challenge. What what have been the biggest um, learnings from you in the work that you've done on that so far? I think first and foremost, and this is a very big personal learning, I've spent you know the good part of 10 years working by myself. Even when I worked in teams and I had team members, I always did most of the things myself. Um, so that has been a huge learning gap for me in stopping and actually doing what I do best and letting, it's not a control thing. I think it's just a habit thing, letting things go to others. Um, and that's been a big part of it. But I also think dynamics and, and team dynamics is really important. You know, if, if certain people vibe in different ways with with different people. Certain people need different communication. And I think that the mm. comparison that you gave there about we work with clients, we go into a client meeting and for the most part, you know, give or take niching, we will perform and do what the client needs. We would deliver We've identified what kind of client they are. We've identified if they're a high detail person, if they're more of a, you know, chatty person. We we identified their, their their challenges and their issues, and we really want to understand them. And sometimes I think we don't take that much effort to understand the person we sit next to every day. And so to really spend some time on, okay, what kind of person is this um, mm. this person I work with, and what how do they like to be communicated to? 
And, and do I bring the same amount of care to my colleagues as I do to my clients? Um, because mm. that, you know, that's a great multiplier. It's something we do a fair bit of. I'm very fortunate within um, Tribeca. We do, we have like fortnightly leadership sessions where we're all about identifying gaps in our own skills and trying to help each other grow. And, and we've, you know, got the Brad Fox, who's got a lot of experience in that, helping that through that. But I think looking back at it and saying, well, what, what are the things that I do? Um, I'm reading a book called Multipliers at the moment, and, and she talks about um, the accidental diminishes. What are the little things that I do that actually diminish someone's capability to, to be at their best? If we've all got the geniuses, if we've got things we're great at and things we're not great at, how do I maximize my colleagues' greatness? And what am I doing that's suppressing that? An example of that might be, you know, um, so something I've been working on is not answering, uh, a, you know, associate and advisor questions when they come to me. So if they come to me and they say, oh, Nathan, I'm working on this case. Can I run this by you? My instinct straight away is to be like, oh, yeah, tell me about it. Cool. Yep, yeah, do that. Mm. When actually what I should be doing is say, well, tell me about it. Now, how did you get to that answer? Now, is there anything in this bit that you've missed? And mm. there may be a bit of silence and then a bit of, and, and leading them to it. It's, they refer to it in the book as putting the, putting the whiteboard marker down in the sense of if you're, if you've got a team of people working for a problem, you could get up and walk them through the problem yourself with the white on the whiteboard, or you could give them the marker, kickstart the conversation and let them solve it. Mm. And I think that's been a massive thing for me in that, in that taking the, the care that I give to my clients back to my team members and admitting when I don't and being honest and open and transparent and, and, and creating that intimacy as well of mistakes and things and growing together. And in doing that, I think everyone has, everyone has their genius. And if we can find our each individual team members genius and let them get the most of that, then, you know, with someone like yourself running the business, it's matching those geniuses up to make sure you've got the most well-rounded teams um, mm. and that everyone is at their best. Yeah. I think that you, and you sort of touched on it there that, the natural instinct is often to do the do the doing. And I know that I've been in the same position like in my previous role before I started my business. I was the main, I did have an, a bit of an assistant, but they weren't technically financial advice. So it, instead of like you could spend a whole bunch of time coaching and, and um, helping someone to learn or you could just do the thing. And mm. often in the moment, doing the thing is a quicker way to get to the outcome, but it also doesn't help that person to grow. And it also traps you in having to keep doing the thing for longer because you're not building that resource in the, in the team as well. I, I think that the communication piece is an interesting one that, as you say, that when you're talking to clients, you do sort of just naturally adapt yourself to their the way that they want to communicate but it's a funny thing that when it comes to our team members and colleagues and the people that report into us or the people we report into that you often don't just naturally think about it in in the same way I, I know I certainly mm. didn't and it took a lot of actual conscious thinking and planning around oh yes okay this um, person likes bullet points this person doesn't like bullet points so much you know like all of those things I wonder, did you use any um, any resources or tools or anything? Like for us, we use wealth dynamics profiling that gives us a bit of a, um, you know, be flow profile. It's not specific to communications, but it does give you some insight around that. Did you, do you use any sort of resources like that or how did you actually figure out how to best work with the people in your team? So we've got, we've used um, VIA Strengths and DISC. So DISC, we used to use DISC at NAB going back a decade ago as well. It's a, it's similar to a few of the others. It's not a perfect model, but it does do a pretty mm. good job where you've got, you know, D and I are extroverted traits. D is task-focused extrovert. Let's get this done now. I is people-focused extrovert. It's kind of like I'm very, I max out on the I <laughs> and I'm fairly high D. Mm -hmm. um, S is um, people-focused introvert. The, the the carer, the quiet, sit back, but always reliable, the listener. And then C is the um, task focus introvert, the high detail, the, you know, and, and it's little things like, you know, they've got people in our office that, so my D takes off, o, often takes over where mm -hmm. just saying to someone who's a high, high I, high S, so very people focused, 
in an email saying, hey, how you going? Can you do this? Versus someone who's high D, Ben, blah, blah, blah. Like it, that's such a different way where people can get either, you know, offended if you're not including some of those niceties and they don't respond as well to it. The slightest changes in that communication, um, you know, or something I've noticed sometimes if, I, if I've made a mistake or something or I've missed something, my, my high D takes over and I'm just like, yep, no worries, I'll fix that. Instead of, hey, sorry, you know, just note that I've, I've, I, you know, I know that I've done that wrong. I'll fix that for you. This is little things. It only yeah. needs to be 5% in that direction. Um, mm. And then the VIA strengths one is more around, you know, what are you, what are your strengths and what are you great at? And um, a little exercise I used from uh, the Multipliers book was a thing called Naming the Strengths. And I did that with my team the other day where, we basically all, it sounds a little Larry Fairy, but I tell you, it, it was really powerful. We basically wrote down what, he, what we thought each other's genius was. What's the one thing that that person does that takes, that they just do it effortlessly, but it's an amazing trait. And we went around in our, in our team meeting and went, okay, let's name them. So no one named their genius the same as what everyone else thought. You know, one of the team members said to another one that, you know, it was always so calming when things are really stressful, you just seem to be able to bring some sense in. Now that person didn't realize that was a trait they had. But since then, I've noticed because they've named that genius, they they stepped up more into those things. They see someone who's stressed and they step in and try and help calm. And it's little things like that that I think we often don't know how others see us. And when we learn about what we're great at, we can become, we can lean into those things more. So there are a couple of different tools that I've used and I'd highly recommend the Multipliers book as well. Um, there's a few videos on as well, but I'm really enjoying that read um, around just trying to get the best out of each other and mm. and taking a little bit more time in that connection. Yeah, I like it. I think those resources can be helpful. They're not going to solve anything on their own, but uh, you sort of need, need that, as much of an advantage as you can with how complex mm. that, that area is. I wonder, as someone that's been coaching people within the team, for people that um, are sort of less senior that are listening in, that are wanting to be coached or, uh, you know, looking like sort of earlier on in their development path, what would your tips be for them as to how they can get the most out of their own development in their team? And what, you know, how focused necessarily that team is on their development? I think this is one of those things that depends on the business and it also depends on the individual. So if you're in a business that is progressive and wanting to strive, you can, I reckon you could ask. I think you could ask and engage. Um, you could also always get external people, but at the same time, you're not, no one's limited to the business that they're in. And I look at, say, the um, Tiana, who I'm mentoring at the moment, and she messaged me on LinkedIn after we met briefly at a, at a function and said, hey, can I have coffee? I want to pick your brain. I was like, yeah. Like, you took the effort, absolutely. And then she's like, can we do this regularly? We're looking at time. Is this work for you? And I'm like, she's a jet, so I'm absolutely happy to, to work with her and help her develop. But it took it took a lot for her to make that, you know, ask that question. And I look mm -hmm. back into what set my career up. And I still talk to my mentors now that I've had. Yeah. I still catch up with and one of my mentors is Luke Ashby, ex MLC BT insurance. And, and I look up, still contact, catch up with him once every six weeks. And we just chat. And even now, just talking through what I'm going through or what I'm working on with him, he always just seems to have something enlightening that comes across. And mm. your mentors can be for different things. Uh, but I think you, if you don't have a mentor, you should probably find one. And you'd be surprised by just asking people for help. You know, I've got mm. a couple of people that are casual, casually mentoring. Every six months they'll ring me and give us what I'm working on. But something a bit more regular, I, I tell you, it's really powerful. And it's it's actually working with Tiana who sort of said to me, well, I don't have that regular person anymore. Who do mm. I go to now to catch base with it, you know, that knows me but also knows what I do and can and expand and multiply my my capability? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that most people would be surprised as to how many like superstars there are out there that would be open to doing that sort of stuff, like mm. giving up their time and, and helping people to grow. I know for me, like I, through the AFA's mentoring program, like way back in the day before I started my business, I got hooked up with Dean Holmes, who, um, runs the wealth network now and uh yeah he volunteered his time and i sort of got into this mentoring relationship with him and he was like all over it and had so much gold and it helped me learn so much and i was like 
I just sort of, you know, sunk my claws in and was like, I'm not letting go here because mm-hmm. the amount of development that you get from that, for, particularly from someone that's external, that's not your boss or, um, you know, a senior member in your team that you can have those really transparent conversations with that can challenge you around things that it helps, it helped me progress a lot further and faster than I would have, I think, if I was just relying on the business themselves. So I think for anyone that's listening in that thinks that would be helpful, uh, reach out, you know, go along to events, meet people, chat to them, you know, ask them for that coffee and and do that and you'd probably be surprised to, uh, as to the outcomes. Um, Especially in this industry where we're naturally helping people, where the financial advisors are a unique kind of person where we're both analytical and but also very caring. And so I think if you look at compare this to other industries, I reckon there'd be a greater proportion of people who would be willing to do that work because of the kind of people it takes to do this job. Mm, absolutely. Nathan, you mentioned just when we were chatting before we fired up the recording um, about some of the things that you're working through in your business around team structuring and, and uh, how that's all fitting together. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's going on there? So I think one of the interesting things at the moment is this is we've got a sort of gulf in skill sets or, or valley, if you want to call it. We've got a, a number of people that are really that have been around for a long time that'll be you know, leaving. We've got a, a batch of you know 10, 15, 20 year you know, experienced advisors. And then there's kind of this gap and then it's like three to four years. And then what seems to be, and by the numbers, a large amount of new entrants into into the space. And most of the new entrants are really young as well, um, which is not a problem. But if we start looking at the gap we have in our skill set as, as an industry, I think the amount of, of businesses hiring advisors right now that just cannot find the right, there's, there's, there's a shortage of advisors. And it's not just about hiring any of them. It's about finding the right ones that fit your philosophy and your business. That's um, right. And with a shortage, yeah, it makes it really hard as well. And, yeah, I, I look at that gulf or that valley and I'm like, how do we fill that? And I think there's two ways. You either develop someone from, you know, from the ground up and that's the associate thing um, or you or you hire external skill sets and bring them in. And I think that's something I think as an industry you might need to start looking for is like, you know, what are the other other areas as it teachers or, or lawyers or whatever it might be that have life experience and transferable skills that we could bridge over, but they still need to go through that associate program. Yes. And I think that that's really, really hard. So then the next question is, well, if there's only so many advisors that are great at what they do, how do you get them doing advice? How do you get the surgeons doing surgery and stop them having to do all the other stuff? Because there's a capacity constraint industry wide right now. Mm. And, you know, and, and how do you enable them to see more clients and get more done while training the people coming up from below? I think getting that resource mix right is really hard because the more resources you give an advisor, the more clients they have to see. So they're, their field of work shrinks um, and their expectation of the outcome they can create grows. So you're getting a lot more key person risk on that. They might go from having to do four clients a month to eight clients a month or something, but they're now got twice the resources so they could do it. And it's, it's just such an, it's an interesting dynamic that I think the whole industry is sort of seeing at the moment of how do we get the most out of the people who are scarce, enabling them with people around them while filling that gulf. Absolutely. And I think that the demand for advice is increasing. Advisor numbers are going down. And then when you overlay that with the fact that every business is different, different culture, different clients, different approach, different philosophies, when you look at the how big the pool of advisors is that could fit the bill to be, a, be the frontline sort of particularly those more senior advisors, uh, that you want in business, it is incredibly challenging. I was sharing with you that we were hired, we've been hiring, we had been hiring for the last 12 months. I'm happy to report that we're not. Um, we have finally filled those those key advisor seats that we were looking for and we will be hiring again soon. But, you know, it took, a, it took us a year to find two advisors that ticked all of the boxes and it was slow going and super frustrating. But ultimately with the advisors that we've got, I know that we made the right call, um, but yeah, it just means that you do need to get more. And for us, we work with a 
pod structure where we've got every advisor's got an associate and a para planner, which we found allows us to then get get the output up from the advisors because they've got this support team behind them. And the other the other big advantage that I'm seeing, and it's not a it's certainly not a short term fix, but it means that because the the associates are doing more of the advice work and over the time you you want them transitioning to essentially be basically doing all of the advice work it means that at some point in their development you say well, okay okay actually you're you're now doing all of the stuff and therefore you know you can start seeing clients and of course yeah you mm. do the py and you know um, make sure everything's all sweet on that side but more so that you you know the business has got the confidence that the associates can deliver in the way that you want and i've found that like we've employed advisors that have got you know a decade of experience but it still takes them a while to get their head around the way of doing things whereas when you've got an associate that's grown up into the model that they're going to hit the ground running from day one knowing all of the stuff that needs to happen behind the scenes and almost at least from a process perspective they're going to be more across it and some superstar advisor that's got 10 or 15 years experience in that space as well. So I suspect that we'll probably see more of that as, uh, as things progress. Certainly if we follow this, the path that we're on now, at least in the short term, as you say, with this bit of a valley, we're seeing some really good committed people coming in now, I think with, um, Mm. you know, those higher standards that we know that the people that are coming into the industry, they're doing the degrees, they're doing the PY, they are really committed but it's going to take some time for them to get to, you know, the ability to be fully um, competent technically, competent from a client perspective and, you know, dealing with with all of those things as well. So I think it's an interesting time. It's a very valuable problem to solve in the meantime, though, for a lot of businesses that, as you say, are sort of gunning it uh, on the hiring side. And I don't think there's one perfect solution there, but um, it's interesting to talk to people that are trying out different things all, all with the same end goal in mind and i think the conversation i've had with the with a number of really great practices lately is it's always long-term minded it's always they're investing in people and they mm. know that one or two might not fit the bit but they they're willing to take that investment in that person to the next mm. level to get a great outcome and we can only benefit from that industry wide you know i think that's that level of if you go back a decade and it's like throw a salesperson in a in a bank playing a job and give them a limited APL and away they go versus now it's yeah. really about developing their their soft skills and their intimacy that building with their client and the human side of advice and and developing great planners which is mm. what, which is what we want we want professionals and this is how it can happen yeah absolutely Mates, uh, it wouldn't be a conversation without you, uh, with you, without talking about ESG. But um, what's the latest? What are you seeing out there at the moment? I think advisors are still uh, still struggling with with sort of some knowledge gaps. We're definitely seeing that. I think what we are seeing a lot more of is ad- advisors doing less portfolio construction and a lot more uh, SMA or multi manager approaches when it comes to ESG. But we are seeing those conversations increase. I'm um, getting a lot more interest and a lot more people messaging me and going, hey, I'm doing this. Is there any better way I can do it? Or starting to see these client numbers add up. And that's really, really cool. Um, one thing I have noticed, though, with some of the you know so different events and things I've gone to, I think sometimes we get too stuck in the details that aren't effective in training advisors for the ESG aspects. And so uh, I've I, for those that follow me on LinkedIn will be probably sick of me spamming it already, but we're actually running, uh, myself, um, Evergreen, and Alexandra Brown from Ethical Invest Group are running a conference specifically on training advisors to have better ESG conversations or ethical investment conversations. And so the entire thing is advisor lens online um, so that anyone can access it. And the idea is there's things like um, you know, animal welfare, um, modern slavery, climate change. What do you need to know that a client might ask you and how do you have those better conversations? You know, there's a workshop on... Um, developing your internal in, in philosophy and questionnaire. Um, and we've got some stuff on compliance and the importance of the standards and within the business and the investment philosophy. Um, and then some fun things. So we've got a, do you remember that um, that show Perfect Match from the 80s where it was like, if we went on a date, yep. Ben, you know, where would you take me or number one? Yeah, we're doing that, but with some fund managers. So that's kind of how to, how to ask fund managers questions to understand for your client. And then we have got a bit of a debate happening. Uh, which will be a bit of fun as well, which is just taking, getting away from just straight panel discussions, which can get very drab 
and uh, and really trying to do something entertaining, but also entirely advice orientated, so that people can start feeling that the, the internal credo we have is taking people from unconfident to competent. Like you don't have to be an expert in this stuff. You just need to start talking to your clients about it. And advisors are still, I'm finding nervous and we want to break through that. The more the ones I work with one-on-one -on, -one on this stuff through ethos, the more they go, oh, actually I can do this. I'm like, yes, you've always been able to, the power was always within you. you know? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just that little confidence first start. And that's what we want to, we want to provide. And where should people, like, I know that you've got your conference and then you do this work with ethos as well, but for people that are keen to, to do more or like for you personally, like where, where do you get your um, information from the knowledge? How can people go about building this knowledge for themselves? I think there's some great publications around FS sustainability. Um, they've got some great stuff. Um, and there's a few others that, you know, that pop up in my news feeds and what have you. I also just found people in the industry and connected with them on LinkedIn and tend to follow, follow them around. Um, and I think there's a few practices that specialize in this that also post up a bit. So you can just sort of follow them, but like good old fashioned financial advice from 10 years ago, we used to learn things from our BDMs. And I can tell you, it, it, people love talking about what they're passionate about, but none more than anyone who works in the sustainable investment space. Like if you mm -hmm. ask to speak to a PM at a normal fund, a portfolio manager, oh, no, sorry, they don't really do that. If you ask to speak to a portfolio manager at any ethical investment fund in Australia, you can get a frontline seat with that person because they just love talking about it. Yeah. And I think that's a really cool way to, to really get, you know, stock stories on the front lines and engagement stories on the front lines. Um, but there are also, you know, RIA, Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, has heaps of resources. Alexandra Brown has a course, which I think is a real step up course that goes through all the different areas and, and really activates your knowledge in that space. Um, and then, you know, we're just neck over the next 12 months, it, we'll, I'll be just be pushing out more and more content um, through the ethos channels, but publicly available for everyone. Cause I just want, I want to see more people having this, you know, we, I ran a session at AFA on exactly this. Here's just a checklist of what you should be doing in your business. I'm not even going to go into detail. Just go and do these things, decide mm -hmm. for yourself, what kind of advice you're going to be in this space? Are you going to be someone who just refers it out? Are you going to be someone who becomes an expert? Or are you going to sit somewhere neutral where you've got options available for clients that want it and you are making sure you're bringing it up? And, and, and that's where I think majority of advisors sit. I think that's, you know, there's, there's plenty of resources out there, but you don't have to go crazy on learning about them to, to get the right solution for clients. That's one of the things that I've noticed in this space is that everyone's generally pretty, like, I think people in advice are generally pretty open to share, but as you say, that people in the ESG space in particular, they're really quite passionate about that and generally pretty happy to give up their time and, and knowledge to help advisors um, do do more and, and learn more and, and play more in that space as well. So, hmm. um, yeah, it's definitely a, an easier one as well that it doesn't really matter how much knowledge that you've got that it's all helping you move forward, right? Absolutely. Nathan, uh, for people that um, are keen to to learn more about your conference and and what it's about, where should they go? What do you want them to know? Uh, look, ethicaladviceconference.com um, is the website. It's a really long website, so I type it wrong all the time. Um, if you if you do follow me on LinkedIn, I'll be posting about it for you regularly, or you can follow us on LinkedIn. Where it's on the 9th of November, uh, so um, it's it's 100 online. It runs the morning. Um, we, we are hoping to run some catch up sessions in the afternoon. I think that the, the beauty of conferences is the face to face part as well in that connection. Mm. So we want to do something post event, like some of the XY events have done. Um, but you know, jump on there. Tickets are, are discounted at the moment. And the closer we get to the event, the less discounted they'll become. So we want people to get on and get on early. We want people to come along. Fundamentally, just want people to be upskilled. And that's what it's all about. So yeah, 9th of November, Ethical Advice Conference. Awesome, mate. Well, uh, pumped for it. Thank you so much for, for sharing your insights there. And uh, yeah, mate, I look forward to seeing you at the conference. Thanks, Ben. See you there.